Nearly 2,000 years ago, uh, Jesus asked those in the towns around Galilee, the leaders and the people, he asked a couple of questions. He said, are you tired? Are you worn out? Now, I reckon that if Jesus asked uh, this question to each of us today, are you tired? Are you worn out? I reckon that for most of us, we would say a big fat yes to that question. You see, there's a few reasons contributing to the sense of weariness and tiredness that we feel. But we're not just physically tired. We also find ourselves tired at an emotional level and a soul level too. You see, the past few years have been particularly challenging because of of COVID. You know, we are feeling some residual impact. We're feeling uh, that COVID has left lots of debris behind, anxiety, angst, fatigue, disappointment, poor mental health, and a whole lot more. And it's impacted us personally. It's impacted our workplaces. It's impacted our families and our homes as well. But perhaps the biggest contributor to the tiredness and the fatigue uh, in our cultural moment that we find ourselves is actually uh, that we live in a fast-paced, 24-7 FOMO culture, where the most common answer to that question, how are you, how are you going, is what? It's good, but what? But busy. This tends to be the common answer for most people today. We are good, but busy. Imagine this. Imagine how surprised you would be if someone uh, responded, do you know what? I'm actually going great. I actually feel like I've got so much space. I feel so much at peace. I have so much margin in my life at the moment. Wouldn't it be a surprise if you heard that from someone when you ask them, how are they going? You see, in our cultural moment, whether you're a stay-at-home parent or a grandparent juggling the demands of young children, whether you're a professional facing the challenges and the opportunities of a a growing business, or maybe even the unrealistic expectations of dissatisfied customers, or you're a student just dealing with the endless assignments and approaching deadlines, life can feel like a grind. And our (coughs) our cultural moment is one where most people are drastically overworked and underslept. We are overspent, yet unsatisfied and underwhelmed. We are overconnected, overstimulated, yet relationally, we are isolated and distracted people. Our modern world celebrates accumulation and achievement, and so there is this continued pressure to upgrade, to upgrade our life, to upgrade our stuff, to upgrade our tech, to upgrade our vocation, our vacations, to upgrade our jobs. You know, psychologists, I actually believe now that many of us suffer from something called hurry sickness. Have you have you heard about this? Psychologist uh, Maya Friedman defines hurry sickness as this: a behaviour pattern characterised by continual rushing and anxiousness, a continuous struggle and unremitting attempt to accomplish or achieve more and more things, or participate in more and more events in less and less time. Hands up if that sounds like you. You see, symptoms of hurry sickness include irritability, hypersensitivity, restlessness, emotional numbness, and non-stop activity. People are calling hurry sickness the Western pandemic. So to sum it all up, We are in a cultural moment and we have a culture that is literally facilitating exhaustion, one that is spiritually forming our souls into a state of restlessness. And the more that this happens, the more we long for restfulness. Catholic priest and author Ronald Ronheiser writes this, Restfulness is one of the most primal cravings humans have. We crave rest to the point where we identify it with heaven. Grant us eternal rest. Today, as our lives grow more pressured, as we grow more tired, as we begin to feel burned out, we fantasize more about restfulness. I wonder if you can resonate with that. So what does a a life of restfulness look like? 
Well, in his great little book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, John Mark Comer uh, shares a little table, and it's going to be on the screen for you. But it, uh, it speaks about, it gives a list of restlessness, what that looks like, and then what a restful life looks like. And he says that restfulness is, is margin over busyness. It is slowness over hurry, quiet over noise, deep relationships over isolation, time alone over crowds, delight over distraction, enjoyment over envy, clarity over confusion, gratitude over greed, contentment over discontentment, trust over anxiety, working from a place of love over working for love and work as contribution over work as accumulation and accomplishment. I wonder for you, which list here describes you the most? How is your soul? And if you take a, a look at your, the, your inner life, which list do you find more resonates with you? If list B is you, uh, then please hear this. There is, there is no guilt here. All right, the reality is that for most of us, most of us would resonate with many of the attributes of List B. We all struggle in this area, and that is why we are doing this series over the next few weeks, because this is important for us to be looking at. You see, here's the deal. Rest is essential to our discipleship towards Jesus. Why? Because it helps us to love God and to love others well. We are commanded to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength and to love our neighbor the same. We can't do that well. We can't love God and love others when we are not rested well. Personally, I know this, that a rested Dan is a better Dan. A rested Dan is actually a more loving Dan all round. I have more margin and more space to love well and to deal with the challenges of life and of other people. You see, without lots and lots of rest, we simply cannot be the people that Jesus calls us to be, the people that Jesus has in mind for us. We cannot live the fullness of life that Jesus has on offer for us. So it begs this question then, how do we experience this restfulness? How do we experience the, the restfulness that we see in list A? Well, in the world of exhaustion and restlessness, the message of Jesus comes to us as good news. It comes to us as gospel. And it resonates with us. It resonates with our world. Why? Because Jesus comes to offer us the rest that we long for. And not just for our body, not just for our mind, but it's rest for our soul. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, which is really the passage we looked at earlier, uh, Jesus goes on and he, he says this. He says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? And then he goes on and he says this, come to me, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. How good. You notice that Jesus doesn't say, come to me and I'll make you successful. Come to me and I'll show you how to accumulate the most stuff. Come to me and I'll help you to achieve and to accomplish wonderful things or to perform better. He says, no, come to me and you'll find rest for your soul and you'll recover your life. Jesus then goes on and he says this, he says, walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. What is Jesus saying here? Well, he's saying this, he's saying that the way of the world the pace of the world will actually end up wearing you out. If we live by the way of the world, the wisdom of the world, we will be marked by burnout, burden and compromise. But if we follow the way of Jesus, or as some other Bible translations say, if we take on the yoke of Jesus, this will lead to real rest and to true fruitfulness. And one of the core practices 
uh, from the way and the life of Jesus that can help us to break free from the exhaustion and the restlessness and to tap in to Jesus' rest for our souls is the principle and the practice of Sabbath. Now, in Genesis 2, at the end of the creation story, this is, this is what we read. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Verse 3, then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now, the word for rested here in Genesis 2 is Shabbat in Hebrew, and it's where we get the English word Sabbath from. It literally means this. It means to stop, to cease, to stop working, to stop wanting, to simply, it's simply a day to stop. See, right after Jesus says, come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life, I'll show you how to take a real rest. Matthew goes on to share not one, but two stories about Jesus and the Sabbath in Matthew 12. And this is deliberate from Matthew. He is wanting us to connect the dots between restfulness in Jesus and the practice of Sabbath. And one of the stories that Jesus tells, uh, the, the gospel writer Mark also tells, and I want to have a look at his, uh, at his story in Mark chapter 2, verse 23. He says this, One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Now, Let's just stop there for a minute. What is, what is going on here? Well, firstly, we see that Jesus, that built into the way and the life of Jesus, was a day every week that was set aside to press the slow-mo button and to stop. But on this Sabbath, what we see is we see that the religious leaders had a crack at Jesus' disciples and they were dobbing Jesus' disciples into Jesus saying, look, your disciples are breaking Sabbath rules. Sadly, all this shows is that the religious leaders had sorely missed the heart of God behind the practice of Sabbath. And so Jesus lovingly rebukes them. And this is what he says. Have a look at verse 27. He says, The Sabbath was made for man or mankind, humankind, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. What a, what a beautiful response. Another way we could say this is the Sabbath was made to serve us. We weren't made to serve the Sabbath. You see, Jesus was not doing away with the practice of Sabbath here. He isn't anti-Sabbath. Rather, he's anti the legalistic, guilt-ridden religious culture that had totally missed God's heart and purpose behind the gift of Sabbath. You see, Israel's leaders, religious leaders, had added literally hundreds of other laws and regulations about what you can do and you cannot do on the Sabbath in their attempt to not to break the fourth commandment. And Jesus, in other passages, speaks of all these other laws that have grown up on top of the Torah, and he actually calls them human tradition. And in doing this, the religious leaders had turned a life-giving gift of a day of rest and worship to God into a legalistic rule that ultimately sucked the life out of them. You see, Sabbath was ultimately given as a gift from God for the flourishing of humanity. God made the day holy and he blessed it, not because he wanted to spoil our fun, but because he wanted to deepen our joy. Fast forward to today. And I think we actually have the exact opposite problem uh, to the Pharisees. Uh, we haven't got hundreds of rules wrapped around the Sabbath like the religious leaders did. Rather, Sabbath is hardly on our radars at all. I grew up in church life and I don't even think I heard the word for 15, 20 years nearly. Sometimes we might even think it was just, it's just part of some other denominations practices. 
Sabbath has been largely forgotten in our discipleship towards Jesus. A.J. Swoboda uh, writes this in his book, Subversive Sabbath. He writes, the Sabbath has largely uh, been forgotten by the church, which has uncritically mimicked the rhythms of the industrial and uh, success-obsessed West. The result? Our road-weary, exhausted churches have largely failed to integrate Sabbath into their lives as, listen to this, as vital elements of Christian discipleship. It is not as if we do not love God. We love God deeply. We just do not know how to sit with God anymore. Wow. Let that sink in for a moment, especially that last line. We love God deeply. We just do not know how to sit with him anymore. Church, our first and most important work is to be present with God. Like Martha, we can be too busy working for Jesus that we actually miss being with Jesus. And so in a culture that is conspiring to make us sick and tired, emotionally and physically, a culture that is spiritually forming our souls into a state of restlessness and exhaustion, the practice of Sabbath is probably one of the most countercultural and important practices that we need to reawaken right now to ensure that we are people who remain present with God and learn how to sit with God again. Uh, Walter Brueggemann writes this. He says, I have come to think that the fourth commandment on Sabbath is the most difficult and the most urgent of all the commandments in our society. Sabbath, in the first instance, is not about worship. It's about work stoppage. It is about withdrawal from the anxiety system of Pharaoh, the refusal to let one's life be defined by production. And we're going to look at this more in about week three or week four of this series. You see, we need to see Sabbath for what God intended it to be, a gift of grace to remind us that we are worth more than our work, that we are more valuable than what we produce, that Sabbath is a reminder that we are human beings, not human doings, that we are not machines. Tim Keller writes and says this, Sabbath is where you live like your work is done, even if it isn't. And that is healing. Sabbath is where you remember that he is God and this world will go on, even if your list doesn't get done. And Eugene Peterson warns and says, if you don't take a Sabbath, then something is wrong. You're doing too much. You're being too much in charge. You've got to quit one day a week and just watch what God is doing when you're not doing anything. Now, Sabbath is, is not just a, a day off. And we're going to talk about this in, in the coming weeks more. But too often we seek rest in ways that are not actually restorative or renewing for us. We are very good at knowing how to relax. We are not so good at knowing how to renew and to heal. Um, Jesus performed many of his miracles. In fact, a lot of his miracles he performed uh, and his healings he performed on the Sabbath. Now, why was that? Was he just trying to, to show the Pharisees uh, and the religious leaders what it, what it actually means, the heart behind the Sabbath? Well, sure, that might have been what he was doing. But in my opinion, I think Jesus does many of his miracles and healings on the Sabbath to show us that when you actually create space in your life for God, then healing happens and miracles and healing and renewal are released in your life. You see, Sabbath is about engaging in activities that are life-giving for your soul, that deeply connect you to Jesus and his restfulness. Binge watching your favorite show on Netflix till 1 a.m. in the morning can be a great way to relax. But is it actually replenishing you and creating space for God to refresh your soul and to release healing and miracles? Well, let's be honest, probably not. Next week, we'll spend some more time together unpacking a biblical framework of Sabbath. 
uh, what it really is and how we might actually go about shaping and designing up a, a Sabbath in our week. But, but that's for next week. But for now, I just wonder this. Do you have a day in your week that is unlike any other? A day where you stop. A day in your week that reminds you that the reminds you that the world keeps going even if you don't know what's going on. A day to stop, a day to rest, a day to enjoy your life, your world, and to delight in God. Now, full disclosure, um, I am far from a Sabbath guru. Okay, uh, I don't. A Sabbath for a full 24 hour period a week. However, I am learning to practice and to enjoy the art and the gift of Sabbath a whole lot more. Uh, Sabbath has been increasingly capturing my attention and my heart over the last few years. And so every year for the last three years, I've deliberately built in more and more moments of Sabbath in my week. And it has been good for my soul. It has been good for my family, for my closeness and my walk with God. It has been good for my sense of peace. And after moments of Sabbath, there's no doubt about it, Dan becomes a better human. Now, I want to just uh, also just address uh, some objections that some people may have. Of course, there are lots and all sorts of debates and disagreements about whether or not as followers of Jesus, we still need to keep and observe the, the Sabbath. Some will say, well, we're in, the, we're in the new covenant now, and so there's no need to keep the commands uh, of the Torah. Others will say, well, it's one of the Ten Commandments, so why wouldn't we expect to, to keep it like we do the, the other nine? Others will argue about the correct day and uh, what you can and you can't do on the Sabbath. But honestly, in my opinion, I feel these objections and debates miss the point. Why? Because ultimately, and we'll look at this next week, Sabbath is a rhythm that was built into the very fabric of creation. And so if God has designed the world to work with a six and one rhythm, then we can ignore it. We can suppress it. We can make excuses for it. We can look for ways to get around it. But going against the rhythm that God has put into creation will have consequences. God has given Sabbath as a gift to serve us. Six days we work, but on the seventh, we have the freedom of resting. A day to stop long enough to experience him. A day to step out of the traffic, to step away from the exhaustion and experience the restfulness of Jesus. Who doesn't want that? Who doesn't need that today? John Mark Comer, he puts it this way. He says, you can skip the Sabbath. It's not sin. It's just stupid. You can eat concrete. It's not sin. It's just dumb. And then he goes on and he says this, Sabbath is more than just a day, but it's not less. It's a way of being in the world. It's a spirit of restfulness that comes as a result of living in our Father's loving presence all week long. And so please hear me today. This series is not about giving you laws or rules to obey. This is not about adding any heavy weight or any additional burden to anyone. Rather, my hope is simply this, that you will get a vision of what life with God, creation, your family, our world could be like if we awakened to the gift of Sabbath today. So let me ask you, what do you want for your life? What do you want for your life? Do you want a restless, exhausted, distracted, anxious you? Or a you that is living all of life with a sense of ease, gratitude, wonder, love, joy, and peace? As Walter Brueggemann so beautifully put it, he says, people who keep the Sabbath live all seven days differently. So each week, to help us tap into the restfulness of Jesus, we will be encouraging you to adopt a habit for the week. Uh, this week's habit uh, is a digital detox. 
For many, the idea of turning off your devices for an extended period of time sounds terrifying. I get it. Uh, digital addiction is real. Uh, author Le Anne Lemke, she puts it this way. She says, we're living in a time of unprecedented access to high reward, high dopamine stimuli. Drugs, food, news, gambling, shopping, gaming, texting, sexting, Facebooking, Instagramming, YouTubing, tweeting. She goes on and she says that the smartphone is the modern day hypodermic needle delivering digital dopamine hits 24 seven for a wide generation. It's a real thing, digital uh, addiction, but there are so many benefits to doing a weekly digital detox. And uh, not the least of which is an increased capacity for us to encounter God and one another in rest. So this week, here's the, here's the habit we want you to adopt. Choose a period of time. A full day is recommended, a whole 24 hours, but here's the deal, begin where you're at. Begin where you're at. If it's two, four, or eight hours of awake time, then great, just start there. And use that time to rest to be present with family, to be present with self, to worship, to pray, and to delight with God. Now, again, just to stress, none of these habits are rules. They are only invitation. It's all invitation. They are best practice. But we will strongly be encouraging and urging you to do these because we believe that it's good for your soul. It's good for our witness. It's good for our families and our church, but they are not rules to obey. Now, uh, later on this, this week, probably the next couple of days, if you're part of our online uh, Facebook community, then we're gonna put in there uh, a PDF uh, that includes uh, the digital detox, what we want you to do. Uh, if, if you're not, then we'll, um, we'll work out another way of getting that, uh, that, that to you. But that's going to drop into the Facebook uh, group. And so please look at that. And this week, uh, plan some time to take a digital detox. But I want to close today by reading a story that Richard Foster shares about a friend of his in one of, uh, in one of his books. And, and this, is, this is the story that he shares. One day, a friend of mine was walking through a shopping mall with his two-year-old son, and I can kind of connect with this because uh, my boy is 16 months. The child was in a particularly cantankerous mood, fussing and fuming. The frustrated father tried everything to quiet his son, but nothing seemed to help. The child simply would not obey. Then under some special inspiration, the father scooped up his son and holding him close to his chest, began singing an impromptu love song over him. None of the words rhymed. He sang off key. And yet as best he could, this father began sharing his heart, saying, I love you, son, he sang. I'm so glad you're my boy. You make me happy. I'm so proud of you. I like the way that you laugh. I love you. You are my boy. You are my son. On they went from one store to the next. Quietly, the father continued singing off key and making up words that did not rhyme. The child relaxed and became still, listening to this strange and wonderful song. Finally, they finished shopping and went to the car. And as the father opened the door and prepared to buckle his son into the car seat, the child lifted up his head and simply said, Sing it to me again, Daddy. Sing it to me again. Church, this is a beautiful story that captures the heart behind Sabbath. You accomplish nothing. You don't perform or achieve anything. And God still loves you because you are his child. A.J. Swoboda so beautifully said, Sabbath is a scheduled weekly reminder that we are not what we do, rather we are who we are loved by. How good is that? It reminds me, of course, of 1 John 3, 1, where we're told what marvellous love the Father has extended to us. Just look at it. We are children of God. That is who we really are. Uh, 
I want to come and just have a time to pray. Even right now where you are, you might want to just have some time now or as we sing in a moment or even after our service just to spend with God. Just to spend reminding yourself that you are a child of God, that you are loved by him. And to spend some time just resting in his beautiful presence today. But let me come and pray and just to welcome the Spirit of God with us. Spirit of God, we, we thank you for your presence with us today. Lord, we thank you that in Jesus we can find the rest that our soul so longs for. Lord, we thank you for this practice of Sabbath, one that reminds us that we are not God, one that reminds us that you are the one who is holding all things together and we are not. So Lord, I pray that we would be those who would remember that we are not so important that we cannot take time away from our week to spend a day in the presence of Jesus, I pray. Lord, this, the way of Jesus brings life. Sabbath is something that will help us to tap into who you are and your restlessness. And so, God, it is my prayer that we would be those who learn throughout this series to tap into the restfulness of Jesus through the gift of a Sabbath. So, Lord, right now, I pray that we would experience a special touch of your restfulness right now. Would you come and just minister to our spirits, minister to our souls. Take the weight off of our hearts, the burden off of our shoulders. And Lord, we rest in the loving arms of our Father and our God. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Amen.